Thank you, thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. And uh, thank you for being here uh, and giving me an opportunity to talk about uh, some of the things I've been thinking about for a long time. And I hope they, uh, if they do not make sense tonight entirely, I hope they point in directions in which uh, you will be able to go and think about and they will hopefully make sense. I know it sounds kind of esoteric to talk about uh, remote viewing and non-local consciousness, but we'll, we'll simply make it as, uh, uh, as simple as it has to be for me to grasp it and talk about why it's relevant to hacking. This talk is really about you. It's about your innate intrinsic ability to observe the deeper aspects of yourself or the dimensions or the structures. The language is hard to use because um, these things are imprecise and yet, and yet they're very important, I think. It's your ability to observe the deeper dimensions of your own consciousness or the structures of your own cognition when you are engaged in hacking. And I mean high level, immersive, deeply intransitive hacking so that when you find yourself lost in that immersive process and you actually enter into the system, when you are engaged with the system in a way that involves what we call intransitive attention, you forget yourself and lose yourself in the process, almost. And at the same time, watch yourself hacking. If the part of your mind that watches yourself watching can back up and watch your own processes, and watch, in effect, your own mind engaging with the interface of the system with which it engages and at the same time distinguishes between yourself and the system that you are hacking. This talk really is about your ability not only to see that, to know how to go there, but to remember how to do it and how to go there so you can go again as you choose or as you allow. And that, in turn, empowers you to bring that self-awareness uh, that knowledge, that power, to big picture hacking, which is the larger enterprise of your life, to your obsessive passion for knowing what works and how it works, not only in technical machinery, which is human made, but in the entire universe. So it's really about the process of hacking turning into a metaphor in the middle of itself for how you engage with the other enterprises in your life. Because hacking is not uh, not just a hobby or not just something trivial that we add on to who we are. When you engage in it as the best of you have, uh, it, it literally becomes your modus operandi in the world and it becomes your approach to all other things as well. And incidentally, if you can do this, then it will also make you a better hacker. Because you will know the differences that matter, the differences that make a difference. Gregory Bateson said, information is the difference that makes a difference. Information is the difference that makes a difference. My observation at this point in my life is that information is available everywhere and always because it is the intrinsic nature of the universe to disclose itself, to include sentient life forms like us in the process of becoming first aware and then self-aware. That is aware and then aware that we are aware. So what hacking, in fact, is doing as a transformational process from the 70s, 80s, 90s into this century is exactly what General Hayden referred to at Black Hat in his really quite clear and excellent keynote. Uh, it is a new domain, a new domain of consciousness and a new domain of action which cannot be translated back into the prior domains which belong to a time of prior technologies which shaped our relationships and our cognition and our very sense of identity and our being in a completely different way because the technology does make those forms go liquid and we find ourselves having to retailer ourselves for the new shape and the new fashion that the new technologies uh, make available. So in 45 minutes, this is an attempt to sketch out how remote viewing, how non-local consciousness, how big picture hacking, and how knowing who you really are give you not only root, but the root of all roots. I've included a number of documents on the CD. They include uh, reviews of books that I've written. They include interviews with people like Edgar Mitchell, the Apollo 14 astronaut, or Joseph McMonagle, one of the prime, uh, one of the most more excellent remote viewers in the NSA Stargate program uh, and other people who have tried to engage with the darker sides and the shadow sides of these enterprises 
in order to find out what's really real so that it can relate to the things that we take so for granted when you sit in front of a computer screen today and simply engage with it. So it's really about mindfulness and vigilance. Mindfulness and vigilance. Know yourself and be aware. It's really about just that. But it's about doing that more and more deeply. There was a guy who formed a program called EST once upon a time. He took a lot of flack for it, but really it was quite powerful process that delivered the experience of no mind the Zen notion of Sartori in a couple of weekends in a basement of a hotel. It was quite an American Esalen type accomplishment, but he really did it. And the way he characterized, you have to forgive my language, but it's Werner's language, not mine. Uh, he characterized this level of awareness as really simply knowing the difference between your own ass and a hole in the ground. And he characterized the mystic at the same time as someone who simply knows what's so. And he added, he also knows so what? In other words, knowing what's simply so is the most that you can get your mind and your hands around, and knowing that it's so what, because it doesn't point to anything deep or profound at all, but something very light, is why there's a lot of laughter in the halls of Zen monasteries, and there is also a tremendous amount of laughter in the hallways of hackers, and I think some of it is for the same reasons. Because what looks to be real, as you engage with it, dissolves and discloses another level of the game. And this happens inside ourselves also, and in deep states of meditation, as well as when we engage in that intransitive way, that selfless way with the system we are hacking. So in hardcore hacking, it means beating the mind that designed the system. But in life, it means aligning with the larger universal mind that seems to have designed the system as well. I'm going to refer as well to experiences of strangeness that people have in the presence of what we call serendipity uh, UFO experiences. The strangeness seems to be a function of the alteration of space-time in the presence of whatever it is that causes the experience. They cause anomalous experience and then we start to get the idea that what we call anomalies are really the centers of entirely new ways of constructing reality, physics, and science and biology and other things as well. And so anomalies are not really anomalous at all. Anomalies are foundational of the next stage of understanding. And in a wonderful book Einstein wrote in the 30s on the evolution of physics, he talked about the transformation of the mechanical and the Newtonian view of physics into relativity and quantum mechanics. And he does it in that book with a great deal of clarity uh, but it always begins with anomalies, calling attention to themselves and compelling you not to ignore them, but to ask if this is true in the universe, what else must be true? Uh, so, I know that sometimes in the 15 years that I've been speaking here and in other places that I've been speaking, before that in my other careers, people have questioned my sanity. I do understand that. Uh, there's a fellow who's heard me speak in the Netherlands a lot. He's with the CIA equivalent. Uh, in Suriname, and he wrote to me after reading some of the things I'd written, exactly from which planet do you come? And Robert Morris Sr., not the Morris Worm Morris, uh, but the old man, uh, kindly took my book, Islands in the Clickstream, at a Black Hat briefings many years ago, and he read it one night, and he returned the next morning, and he said, you do know, don't you, that you are insane? And I said, thank you very much. And he said, I was hoping you would take that as a compliment. Another friend of mine uh, who works at NSA, reading my current book, to which I will refer, Mind Games, because the material for it comes from the same place as this talk comes from. Uh, after reading the first chapter, uh, in the introduction to which he is quoted, because he called me up and said, you know, don't you, uh, that 95% of this first story is, uh, is not fiction. He said it reminded me of Robert Redford's movie, The Three Days of the Condor, where the CIA agent uh, read fiction to find out what was real. He said, but the key is, of course, you have to know which 5% is a lie in order to have the key to the code. And then he laughed and laughed because he agreed that people will probably think what is true is not true in the story, and what is not true is true. It's called Zero Day Roswell, and it's about the uh, uh, suicide crash of a spaceship in order to give us the internet uh, the purpose for which is for us to put everything on the internet so that the alien species does not have to waste its time going to cocktail parties and things like this and taking notes 
that if it just gave us the internet, get a couple of suicide grays to be willing to crash the ship, give us the, the fiber optics, give us the chips, they knew we would build the internet, they knew we would put our consciousness entirely on it, and we would tell the whole universe everything. Well, that's pretty funny. But the uh, parts that underpin it are insights into how, in fact, people do go behind systems uh, and what they do with those systems when they get behind them, and it's not always what people uh, say they do. Uh, things are not what they seem is in this, this book, Mind Games. If it has a theme, it's the themes are not what they seem, and that's another way of saying that anomalies call attention to a deeper and different reality. So I tell you those stories of myself because uh, I know really that I wasn't insane. That insanity, like wisdom, is contextual. Oh, I've had my doubts. And I'll talk about those moments in which you are so changed by what you are learning and what it is doing to you, which some of you may have experienced as well, that you experience a traumatic state. But insanity, like wisdom, is contextual. And if you see those anomalies first, the context that is missed by other people, which is what hacking really is, so that you can manipulate it and turn the context into content, then you will look as if you are insane to those who see only the, the picture itself and not the frame and not the ground of the picture itself. Because the truth is that that Suriname CIA man also said, through your writing I discover reality again and again, and Robert Morris Sr. held up the book in a seminar and said, everything I needed to know in life I learned from this book. Uh, which was his way of saying, there, I paid you for the book. Uh, and uh, Hal is a fellow with whom I have discussed these deep, real things again and again. Now, to understand security, you need the notion of a pattern. But as a friend of mine at CIA said, uh, not that I work at CIA, but as a friend of mine who works, at, I work for nobody. You know, I, I, I have nowhere to lay my head. I, I'm all things to all people and nothing to anybody in particular, except an opportunity in a space. But uh, this is a friend at CIA. Uh, she said, you do not know what assumptions the system is making. What assumptions are implicit in the architecture of the system you're hacking? You can't query the system about its own assumptions, because it cannot reveal in a self-conscious way its own flaws. The system is not self-aware. What does the system think it knows that it may not, in fact, know? In other words, what is intrinsically built into the system as assumptions that the system itself is not aware has been built in? People who build systems do not understand that principle. And then she quoted the uh, phrase, cryptography is the opiate of the naive. Cryptography is the opiate of the naive. Uh, Peter Neumann once mentioned to me, he was talking to Ron Rivest, who's a well-known cryptographer and brilliant at what he does. And they were talking about voting machines. Ron was pointing out, Neumann is uh, at uh, SRI, has been for decades, old Multics man, and he pointed out that the voting machine is essentially broken. It, c it can be hacked. Uh, but Rivest was focused on the cryptography, and he said, uh, that's not my problem. <laughs> and that's the way people think who see the content as if it's all that matters rather than the larger context which hackers have to see in order to make the system do something for which it was not designed. The environment in which the logic is running is an unknown from a security standpoint. And the environment, too, the context needs to be audited. Turtles all the way down. Context must be turned into content. So that's why it's not a good idea to use new environments for security critical code. You may remember when PHP came out, people rushed to it because it was easy to use. But it caused a few problems coming down the road. So looking at the context seeing it clearly, and then articulating it, and then realizing that you yourself are the context for the foundational knowledge by which you see, and seeing that clearly is the subtext of this talk. Fifteen years ago, I did my first talk at DEF CON. It was called Hacking as Practice for Transplanetary Life in the 21st Century. In it, uh, that sounded insane then, but here in the 21st century, I could say to the young hackers who are out there, most of you, um, maybe it's just who's in the front row, you don't look that young anymore, but they were young hackers then. Uh, I was reminiscing with Matt, with Barcode, about our first meeting. I remembered his arrest only a week later, and uh, my first outreach to a young man who knew well that he wasn't 18 and was okay. Uh, but they were young, and I could look at who they were. This is one of the advantages, maybe the only one, of being older, 
is you begin to see life as a telescoping set of episodes or developmental stages and you see the long picture much more clearly. So you see not only who people are in front of you into the, their hearts or souls, but you see who they are in the process of becoming. And I could say to the hackers then, you will be the thought leaders of the next generation and in the 21st century, you will be the ones who must learn how to bring the technology of hacking as consciousness to the tasks that you undertake in the world. Well, I wrote that recently to Mudge. Now, now he's known as Peter Zatko and he's doing re uh, research and development for DARPA. And he said, some of us remember that you said that. Some of us knew what you meant. Some of us thought you were crazy. Of course, at that time, uh, Dark Tangent, uh, Jeff Moss, wasn't on the Homeland Security Advisory Committee. Uh, he was still saying, you know, at 20, if you're working for the man, you're a lamer. And uh, then a few years later, he said, you know, but at 30, if you're not working for the man, you're a lamer. <laughs> and now he, at 40, he is the man. He's on that committee. In other words, those who were kids then are now in special operations, working for intelligence agencies, working for corporate giants. And I'm saying this to try to establish a timeline of credibility because what I'm going to say next uh, will sound some of it insane, that I could see what I was talking about. And I'm trying to make that case. I don't mean to be overtly defensive about it, but I want to say that the future is a construction of possibility here and now for action. And all meaningful communication is communication for action, including your action as a conscious being who's aware of his or her own power and freedom and flexibility and the option of having an impact on other nodes in the network. That's mindfulness and vigilance. But it also means if you're hacking systems that bring you in touch with information and knowledge that is arcane and often hidden from the general public, which has a consensus reality which often excludes it in order to remain comfortable, uh, then it means also that you have to develop an openness to some very weird shit. Now, I'm, I don't mean to use an obscenity, I mean to quote uh, Burn After Reading, uh, one of the Coen Brothers movies, and you remember the, uh, the character, the Jim, the guy who was the uh, uh, fitness instructor, and when he found the notes, the intelligence CD that uh, the other guy had dropped, uh, he said, this is really weird shit. This is some really weird shit. Well, it was. And in one of the documents that I include on the CD, I have a review of a book by Peter Sturrock, uh, a physicist. Uh, he wrote a, a tale of two sciences. Now, I've watched Peter's career over the decades. Uh, he's well acknowledged for his work in, in plasma physics uh, and with neutrinos. A brilliant man, published many, many papers. But he had an alternate life. And this is what it does to you when I say, what does it do to you engage with anomalies and outside of the consensus reality over a lifetime? Uh, it can have an impact on you. He also was very interested in those anomalies. And one of those was UFO phenomena. He wanted it studied for what it looked to be. He wanted it examined because it pretended, it pointed to a kind of physics that simply was beyond our own physics, uh, not what we thought was real, in other words, even after relativity and quantum mechanics had begun to move along. Because all scientists know that those are merely structures of understanding for now based on what we think is real. And Peter experienced and suffered from being so dismissed and ridiculed when he tried to bring the subject up in the most scientific way. And I encourage you to read the review of the book because he finally, at the end of his life, had to make, again, as we so often do, a case for himself by which he advanced his establishment career uh, to show what credibility he had as a physicist as a way of saying this is what science really is about. It's openness to the really weird shit that happens on the edges of our awareness and then looking at it and trying to formulate our understanding of what it is that's happening in a way that makes sense of it. The same way Einstein reacted when uh, entanglement was discussed, spooky action at a distance, which he could not accept any more than he could accept uh, God does not play dice with the universe. That is, he could not accept quantum mechanics, which posits for all states of being possibilities or probabilities, but not certainties and not definite things with boundaries and clarity around them. And so the implications of these things, the phenomena that Peter Sturrock insisted on studying, and the implications of spooky action at a distance or entanglement, 
by which two particles, regardless of how far apart they are across the span of the universe, nevertheless move as if they are one thing. Therefore, the information between them moves faster than light. This leads other people to say, maybe the faster than light limit is not the limit on the universe that Einstein thought it was. And so when I talked to a guy like Tom Keller uh, in the 1990s, 93, he went to hear a lecture by Ben Rich. Ben Rich was the head of Skunk Works. Uh, Skunk Works, as you probably know, uh, was the means by which uh, many of our stealth aircraft were developed. They did black projects and they did them within the context of large corporations. Uh, but did them with a different kind of rules in order to develop uh, some in incredible platforms, uh, like the U-2 uh, or the Blackbird. And in his speech, after he had left the Skunk Works, Ben Rich said, you know, he said, we know now that Einstein wasn't right. We know he was wrong. Faster than light is not the limit on the universe. We already have the means, he claimed in his speech, to travel among the stars, but the technologies are locked up in black projects, and it will take an act of God to get them out. But anything you can imagine, we do know how to do. It just hasn't yet been implemented. There is an error in Einstein's equations, he said, when asked if we could travel to the stars. Uh, Someone said it would take a long time, and he said, no, it wouldn't take a lifetime because of the air in the equations, and we know what it is. We have the ability, if we could build it, to take E.T. home, he said. And then he added the obvious. If anyone has observed the phenomena to which Peter Sturrock refers, we will never get to the stars using chemical propulsion. It will not be action-reaction, blowing gas out of our ass in order to move forward against the propulsion. We will develop a new system, he said, a new technology, and find out exactly where Einstein went wrong so that we can do it. And when he was asked, well, what equations are you talking about? Uh, how does that stuff work, those things which have been observed? He said, let me ask you how ESP works. And someone replied, well, because all points in space and time are connected. And he said, that's right. That's exactly how it works. OK. Spooky action at distance, entanglement of particles, matter that is connected across vast spans of space time so that what happens to one piece happens to another. This is the subtext of the talk. And also, in order to get a hold of what this means for you, what it's going to mean going forward for you who are now the younger hackers who are going to build the next part of the century for us, is to bootstrap the duplicity and the larceny in your hacker hearts to a level at which the dark arts that you practice include and transcend a narrowly self-defined agenda. In other words, serving not only yourself in the process, but it can somehow expand the agenda to global humanity and even to a cosmic notion of all life in the universe. We are, in other words, cells in a body, not just monads, individuals, as we have thought since the Renaissance and not before. Because the technology of printing and the Renaissance is what created the notion of an individual with rights and property rights and intellectual property and life, liberty, and the pursuit of practice. These were emergent properties of the technologies that created the revolution about five or 600 years ago in which you have been born, but through which it is your privilege to also leave and transform into the next revolution, which is the digital revolution, which is going to undermine the notion of individuality in that way. Because when you participate in a network by engaging with the network, you discover soon enough that you are not controlling and dominating the network, which is what mechanical cybernetic processes teach you to try to do in order to manage what you are doing. You find the only way to act is through participating and contributing and influencing in a network because you are a node in the network and there are other nodes of equal status and power and you become a different kind of being, participating and losing yourself, you are no longer the dominant brain of the network. You are a cell, as I say, in a body. And if you start to see yourself that way, 
well, then things begin to change. And your notion of what it is to have power begins to change and how to use that power begins to change. One of the stories in Mind Games is called Species Lost in Apple Eating Time. Uh, it's one of my favorite stories. It's very short. But it simply takes a look at what it is in the universe that would happen if every aperture through which sentient life comes to understand itself, i.e. the human aperture is one, but you know that where life can happen, it does happen. And there is life throughout the universe, intelligent and sentient. And through all of those apertures, every time we hook up with one another, we transform the cultures. So now we have nation states, but they're in the process of dissolving into a planetary culture, and that is just on the cusp that fast of dissolving into a transplanetary culture as we begin to populate our near-Earth space. Now, every time that happens, your identity shifts. Who you think you are is different in the same way that your identity really does shift when you engage with a system that you hack because in the process of watching your mind in its luminous, candescent way late at night when nothing else is happening, but you suddenly stand back and see yourself almost fused with that system, it changes who you think you are because the cognition that you have extends into and even influences unconsciously the dynamics of the system itself. One of the things that was discovered uh, that led the CIA to start looking at remote viewing uh, and psychic phenomena was also psychokinesis. I have talked to people at CIA and at NSA who swear, and you have to swear. You can't just assert an anomalous statement. So you have to swear that there are people we cannot let near our computers because it bungs them up for them to be too close to the computer. The fact of that and the measurement of that and the confirmation of that, that who we are as electromagnetic beings, not just mechanical beings, but who we are as electromechanical systems, has influence on the other systems with which we engage, some more, some less. But don't you see that the point is, as you become conscious that that is you, that's what you are, most essentially are and do in the process of hacking, and that it has that impact, as you can back up and observe where in the brain, where in your consciousness, back here somewhere, Mudula Albangada, around the sides, as it were, in high context cultures, you experience yourself knowing with a different kind of knowing. And you experience yourself more able to manage the effect. And then those are the people that the CIA and the NSA and some others invited into the programs to explore remote viewing, which is really clairvoyance according to protocols designed to enable us to see things clearly in other places without being there. It sounds like telepathy. It is like telepathy. How does it happen, Ben Rich said? Because time and space are a continuum. You see, these are not just crazy concepts. These are emergent concepts of necessity coming from the thought and science and reflection that we are doing. So to reiterate what I said 15 years ago, that hacking is practice for a transplanetary life in a self-consciously transhuman biomechanical future, I mean this now more than I ever meant it 15 years ago. And that's why hacking, to be worthy of the name, as I said last year, has to go beyond information hacking and communication systems, and it must include biohacking. I mean, it must include biohacking. Biohacking is increasingly going forward not an option for a hacker if he or she really wants to do the work of hardcore black hat, white hat, call it what you want, hacking. Now things, because of the information revolution, are moving faster and faster. They really are moving faster in all domains. Now 15 years ago when I talked about what was coming in technology, I could count on a, a time period of a couple of years before the uh, normal media caught up and understood what I was saying and could write about it. I did a talk last year on biohacking, and I thought it was kind of forward-looking in terms of how quickly the cost of doing your own artificial life or genetic engineering experiments uh, had come down, and how in collaboratories you could use biobricks, which Ted Knight and others at MIT had built into module laboratories so that you don't have to do everything from the beginning, just like script kiddies downloading modules and hitting strike. Uh, I thought I was a little head of the game. The next week, my economist came in the mail, and there was a two-page story on biohacking. And they also cited all of the same kinds of people and kinds of concerns that I had. And not other than realizing it was time to retire, what that told me, quite seriously, 
was, was that it is almost impossible where information is moving so quickly to get really far ahead of the game. There's another story in here called the last science fiction story. And the premise is simply that the future can't happen because it's already passed. And therefore you can't write stories about the future because the future is over. Therefore science fiction, which is by definition how a left brain society dreams in a right brain way of its own future, is increasingly impossible. And that is also why science fiction has so radically shifted. I'm not alone in saying this. Bruce Sterling said to me about 10 years ago at a computer freedom and privacy, he said, five years maybe. Same kind of thought I was having. Five years maybe is as far as we can go. But when Jules Verne wrote From the Earth to the Moon in the 1860s, we had 100 years to go before it was realized. When Neuromancer was written in the early 80s, we had about 20 years before people began using the word cyberspace to mean their normative everyday life. Now we don't have that lag time at all. Things are happening faster and faster. And so I noticed another thing happened, called my attention biohacking. MIT appointed a president a few years ago, Susan Hockfield, whose background was biology. When M These are the markers you use. When MIT chooses a president whose background is biology, it says something to you about the future of engineering. And again, as a sign that I wasn't that far ahead, I read an interview with Bill Gates about how he did what he did, and he talked about what he really was above all, was open to possibilities, and the possibility at the time in front of him was the computer. Today, he said, I would not go into computing. I would go into biology. So when you have a convergence of points of view of smart people saying this, Susan Hockfield said about five or six years ago, the challenge of archiving and manipulating large data sets, a common problem in physical science and engineering, is now endemic to modern society. The tools that engineers and physicists develop for their work are finding new life in the biology lab. The Human Genome Project draws on math and computational science every bit as much as powerful new gene sequencing technologies. Therefore, she said, in recent years, the two revolutions in the life sciences, molecular biology and genomics, had triggered a third revolution. Initially, the connection between life scientists and engineers revolved around borrowing tools. Today, what began as a relationship of proximity has evolved into a fruitful new synthesis, a relationship of equal partners with converging questions. In other words, the convergence of those questions is exactly why you cannot consider yourself educated, even in your limited domain, if you know only one thing. If you know one thing, you know almost nothing. Because as she said, in leading labs around the country where these are already building fruit, students are collaborating on projects in engineering, physics, biomedical science, and other fields. We must encourage young people, she said, to pursue work at the convergence, cultivate new kinds of academic organizations, and tune our funding mechanisms toward boundary-crossing work. Now go back to what General Hay uh, Hayden said the other day in the keynote, and it's exactly the same thing, that the emergent understanding of disciplines and domains uh, is so challenging to our fundamental way of structuring our knowledge that it shatters it. But as you know, somebody else said 2,000 years ago, you cannot put new wine in old wineskins, they crack and break. You cannot put new paradigms, new material into old paradigms, they crack and break. You must be cross-disciplinary. You must be exploring opportunities in things that influence and impact one another. And these disciplines do not have names. You know, I realized this first. My, one of my sons is 40 now. And when he was um, 18 or so, he went to Northwestern. He had to choose a major. And um, I remember when he graduated, uh, they said history majors and science majors and so on. And then they said, and we have one ad hoc major. And everybody laughed because it sounded so funny. Uh, but what it meant was that my son, of whom I am justly proud, had seen that he could not find in any one discipline the combination of things he needed to know to do what he wanted to do. He called it symbolic system studies. And he combined material from math and philosophy and cognitive science and artificial intelligence and computer science. And he went to each of the five departments and talked them into giving him credit for different pieces of each, each domain, which for academia is really breaking down silos and creating a new major, in effect, an ad hoc major that had no name. And all I'm saying is those of us who have lived through that and keep going forward know that ad hoc majors is the name of adult learning. We cannot learn unless we learn in a cross-disciplinary way. And that means surf the waves of the different disciplines 
that influence one another, none of which we can master completely. Because now it has grown to a point where the information in any domain of expertise is unknowable in its entirety by any expert in that domain. You cannot know it all. And therefore you're forced back in what Jeff Moss said to me years ago, there's too much to know. So the most important thing I need to know is what I don't need to know, but I need to know who knows it so I can get it when I need it. In other words, the discipline of knowing how to live and work in networks, to be a node in a network, and therefore to exercise power in a different way. Jeff Moss was a kid who called 100 people out of cyberspace to Vegas for a meeting 18 years ago, and now there were 8,000 people here and there were 6,000 of Black Hat. I'm being reflective and kind of nostalgic because 15 years ago I did my first talk at DEF CON. The next year we talked at that convention about starting Black Hat. And the next year Black Hat started and it's grown into something entirely else. What I'm saying is the danger is that you accept what it has grown into and then this is who we have become and this is what we are. And as soon as you think that, you're, o you're old. You're old and you're gone. Because the cross-disciplinary emergence of new ways of thinking and literally new domains of expertise is constantly happening. And therefore you have to constantly learn how to submit yourself to be a node in a network and not a control of the entire network. So, how does all this go together? Well, let me see what time it is. 7.35. Okay. Um, you have to participate in this domain of understanding then the way hackers have learned to participate in a meritocracy by studying everything you can, learning everything you can, and then going to the collaboratory, the online collaboratory, which is now available everywhere always 24-7, and with respect and humility, taking your lack of knowledge to the experts in the domain. Pay attention to what they say, to how they act. Don't come on to them. But with humility, ask for help when you need it. And they know when you have done all the work you can and then are willing to extend the helping hand. Hackerdom has created this meritocracy and it has worked beautifully. Corporations cannot emulate it easily because it is voluntary and participatory and based on influence and a mutual recognition and respect. But it also means that when you work that way, your ego diminishes. And when your ego diminishes, something happens. You know who the big names in hacking are. You want to know a secret? You want to know why you know your name, their names? Because their vocation is to make their name known. That's why. The biggest names in hacking and computer science, you don't know their names. They're in the dark. You know, NSA has about, what, 80,000 people. You know, it's got more, more PhDs per dense mile than anywhere else. Uh, you don't know their names. The people who have done some of the best work in the world in this bifurcated post-World War II of ours, this world, uh, we don't know their names. And you learn as your ego diminishes and you participate in this network that the most important minds that have created this space have labels on them that you cannot read. Their vocation was to create the space and disappear into it. One of my favorite stories in mind games, which obviously I'm trying to sell, a uh, collection of 19 stories, uh, is Gibby the sit-down king. Gibby is, is a king hacker. Uh, all you see of Gibby is the view from the, from the back. You see his jeans way down on his ass and you see the little crack and you see the side of the chair and you see the multi-screened wall in front of which he sits. And why did he get in that position in the first place? Because he was an adolescent and he loved to masturbate. That's why. So he created every sexual scenario he could imagine. And he hit a crisis. I won't give away the whole story, but my favorite image of Gibby is sitting there with both arms bandaged from multiple stress unable to lift one arm off the platform to which it has been tightly strapped because the carpal tunnel is just so painful. And that's when he really conceives of both teledidonics and simultaneously the creation of alter genies which enable people to develop through biomods their own sexual fetishes and preferences and then he distributes those kits to build your own alter genies and change yourself so that you will like what you choose to like instead of, as most people find, what they happen to like. Uh, and, and then he creates the scenarios through hacking which are available in multi-level ways. Well, yeah, I just love that story. Um, be, 
because what happens as he works his way up the ladder of symbol making is he begins to see more and more deeply the kinds of things I'm trying so hard with in vain to describe and he disappears into the very fabric of the mind he ultimately perceives himself to be making the symbols that enable others to make the symbols. So this links to the bigger theme of non-local consciousness and entanglement of particles. We know now that matter is merely dense energy and energy is merely diffused matter. Metaphorically we could say that matter is energy that moves real slow and that uh, energy is matter that moves real fast. But there's fundamentally no difference between the two and that's why matter is entangled with matter. A particle with a particle. What is a particle? A particle is a possibility defined in a quantum way as a mathematical probability at a particular intersection of space-time. So when something is entangled with something else, of course remote viewing becomes a possibility. Of course it happens. Of course it can happen. I have had it happen to me. You have probably had moments of unconscious telepathy or clairvoyance yourselves. The trick is to know that you know that you have those experiences as possible and therefore open yourselves to some very weird shit. It just happened that a friend of mine was the head of an organization in Washington, D.C., who when I brought up remote viewing and what I was learning from talking to the remote viewers in the program, uh, he said, well, you know, we did the evaluation for CIA of the program, don't you? Uh, and of course I didn't, because you never know anything like that. And he said, do you want to see the report? Are you bowing down to me or showing me 10 minutes? Ten minutes. Oh, 10 minutes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it was flattering, but I thought a little over the top. <laughs> Okay, 10 minutes. Uh, so he said, do you want to see the report? And I said, of course. And he sent me the report. And what the report said is that, of course, yes, there is something very much to this. Read that interview with Joe McMonigle. There is something to it. It doesn't happen all the time. A guy named uh, Ken Kress did the program for the CIA. And why did they take it seriously? He said, we could find our attention, he, told, he said, to psychokinetics and remote viewing. That is, to telekinesis to the influence of, quote, physical matter, which is energy, by human beings, which are physical matter, i.e. systems of energy, don't you start to see that when the boundaries dissolve, what you become possible to be is not who you thought you were. And when the subject, of whom he's discussing, placed his attention on the interior of a magnetometer, the output signal was visibly disturbed. There was a change in the internal magnetic field. The descriptions and then when they moved to uh, Pat Price, who began to do remote viewing for the CIA, his descriptions were so startlingly accurate that we suggested the work be continued and expanded. And after one of his remote viewing sessions, two analysts, a photo interpreter and a nuclear analyst from Los Alamos, agreed that his description of a particular site and what was there was so accurate that one, he actually saw it through remote viewing or he was informed what to draw by someone knowledgeable at URDF 3. Now when you read that interview with Joe McMonagall and you read that story of Gibby the sit-down king, you'll see that they both experience something very similar, which is at the level of consciousness which we experience in deep states of meditation, the boundaries with which we describe our identities or the system you are hacking dissolve. You see that it is not that which you used as names, as labels, to approach it, but something utterly else. McMonagall and I agreed that when you reach that level of understanding and experience, language itself breaks. And in several of these stories that I wrote, the language itself breaks as a way to say that you cannot articulate what it is that you nevertheless deeply, truly understand and have the capacity to remember and know that you understand so that you can make it happen again. This sounds like some strange stuff. You know, it really isn't. It's just what's so. In the story in there called Silent, Emergent, Doubly Dark, I try to describe one of the deepest experiences I had, but it's done as metaphor. It was published as a slipstream story or a science fiction story. Uh, and it was about a person who goes into alien cultures in order to learn how alien cultures construct reality by immersing himself in them and then articulating how he has been changed by the process. But in fact, of course, each culture in which he immerses himself 
is a deeper state of consciousness. Much of the detail of the story came from my own experience in meditation. And in one of those experiences, which so profoundly affected me because of the images that were retained as symbols of what I had seen, that following week in Salt Lake City, Utah, I found myself in a bookstore called The Cosmic Airplane, and by an act of synchronicity found a book on the shelf about shamanistic wisdom and read it and discovered that the shamanic journey was not similar to but identical to the images and symbols that had poured forth from my unconscious as a way to grasp and articulate what I had experienced in that deeper state of medication. Meditation. Medication. <laughs> All right, all right, I'll go there. <laughs> one of my sons, I have nothing but genius children, right? All, all special. Uh, one of them worked at a place some of you may know. How many of you know the name Arrowhead? Okay, okay. Well, he did the research for a lot of Arrowhead in five minutes. Uh, this is the time we all take uh, psilocybin and just expand the time, make it 10 minutes. <laughs> and I'll talk real fast, you'll hear it real slow. Uh, he also is a devout Zen Buddhist, so we've had some great conversations. My family includes agnostics, atheists, neo-pagans, Wiccans, Jews, Christians, and Zen Buddhists. So you can, and those are just the children, you know. Uh, <laughs> that's true. Uh, you can imagine what uh, reunions are like. Uh, but what he experienced with psilocybin and what he read about in the experiments of psilocybin, he would always say to me, I read about this, Dad rather than I had quite a trip last night, uh, was identical to what I was saying. It can be chemical. Of course it can be chemical because what else are we but biochemical? And what else happens during deep states of meditation with or without medication but biochemical chemical alterations? Hacking systems, hacking consciousness, hacking biology, hacking your life is essentially the same project. It's seeing connections between things that look disparate and different before and seeing how they can be made together to do that for which they were not made or intended. What I'm trying to describe is trying to be a finger pointing to the moon. The finger is not the moon. Hacking is not the end of hacking. Hacking is practice for seeing complex systems as they are arbitrarily constructed modules by a designer mind which in turn you have labeled and named arbitrarily and built by social agreement into concepts that you can grasp and which based on familiarity and common use become what we all agree socially is real. We call it consensus reality because this is what you have been trained to see so this is what we agree to see and this is what we do see. But as Kant said, concepts without percepts, something to touch, are empty and percepts without concepts are blind. We need a concept and a percept. We need a way of reframing and we need a way of tying it, anchoring it in what is reframed. Hacking is seeing what is in plain sight at the edges of the boundaries of the system but which others overlook. There's a story in there, an uh, interview in here, a review of uh, Joseph Marino. Uh, Marino wrote a book called Mind Wars. There's stuff on Gary Webb. There's all these things that I have down that I don't have time to get into that deal with what it means to explore the dark sides of these things, to go there. Marino tried to find out from neuroscientists, and he has great credentials, great credentials. Read the review, read the interview I did with him, whatever it is in there, I did both. And Marino couldn't get anybody to open up. He said it was like the Manhattan Project, because so much of what we're trying to understand that I'm trying to suggest in this talk is in the dark spaces, in the black projects, behind the scenes. And in order to get it and see it, you have to have the wisdom and the time and the patience of a hacker. You have to have all day and all night. You have to be able to go there and do whatever is necessary to do the counterintelligence operation. Marino said he couldn't get anybody to talk to him. Even though he had worked behind the fence at CIA and done other things with neuroscience, people are so sworn to secrecy. We can keep secrets, and we do. So just like Ben Rich said, it's all behind the fence. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's life since 1945. I asked in a meeting I was helping to facilitate the lead historian at the NSA, tell me the truth. What can we in this room, about 12 of us working on intelligence and ethics, what can we discuss 
with a reasonable understanding that we're talking about the same historical memory. And he said, seriously, anything up until 1945. He wasn't kidding. He wasn't being funny. He was saying that since then, classification, compartmentalization, and the way we have bracketed and separated and kept hidden so many parts, even from those in the system, because they're not cleared to know what someone else is doing next door, has made the discipline, say, of cryptography. They just uh, Hot Khan wrote this wonderful history of cryptography. He may have been blessed and cursed to have seen the emergence of a discipline, the history of cryptography, and its demise as a possibility all in the same lifetime. Because it is no longer possible to access the formally classified documents, even through processes of declassification, into which I could go in depth and detail as to why that makes it even more difficult. Uh, we can't get the facts, and that's why people do project conspiracy theories onto what they know they don't know, but they know it's happening and they don't know what it is, and that's why it takes hackers to break down the barriers that prevent us from building the big picture, because otherwise we have been betrayed by ourselves and have forgotten that our primary vocation and mission is to know. How can we know if what we must know as the building blocks of our knowledge is hidden. In a famous UFO story, I'm finishing, famous UFO story, it may be true, it may not be true, I don't know, but it's a beautiful line. At a time when there were a number of encounters with what looked like a lot like humanoid, humanoid entities associated with ships that landed, which left marks and burned leaves and were photographed, at that time one person was told that he would one day one day leave the earth. And he didn't mean he as an individual, but he as humanity. And what he reported he was told was this sentence, Watchman, one day you will see the universe. Now I personally, on the basis of decades of study with the best researchers on the phenomena, really think the extraterrestrial hypothesis is the best explanation for the data that refuses to go away. As Philip K. Dick said, reality is that which when you stop believing in it refuses to go away. It doesn't go away. People read the interview with Edgar Mitchell. One day you will see the universe. All I'm saying after being here 15 years among you and learning from you is that our response should be like Jodie Foster in Contact where she said, oh, I had no idea. I had no idea. When what you see you thought you believed was an illusion, Maya, a veil that rips, what you're left with is what you see. Just what's so. And the vocation of hacking is to teach us the technology of consciousness and the methodology of approach that enables us to do that, not only with the machinery we've built, which is fun enough, but with the vast universal machinery that seems to have been built prior to our arrival. I guess I have to stop. Huh? All right. Um, thank you.